So I was the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario um, until last month. I was an independent legislative officer, and the largest part of my job was to write reports to the Ontario Legislature and through them to the people of Ontario on energy, environment, and climate. And we did one-page fold-out summaries on all the reports like this, and there are a few of them on the table there. Um, they were also all available online. The links were broken as soon as our office was abolished. But I have reposted them all at my new website, which is saxfacts.com. And this is all work done at public expense. Um, so I think you should still have access to them. Fundamentally, climate change is everything. So that's the main thing that I have spent a lot of my time talking to people about. And if you don't remember everything and anything else I said, you can start with this. Is it as bad as we think? No, it's worse. It's really worse. Uh, I was an environmental and energy lawyer for 40 years before I became commissioner, and I thought I had a pretty good sense of what was going on, and I frankly have been shocked and blown away since I became commissioner as to how much think worse things are than most people think, how fast it's coming, how fast it's accelerating, and we're going to have another, um, I think, mind-blowing report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the largest scientific collaboration in human history, in September, when we get their special report on the cryosphere, which is the frozen bits of the world. So, you know, it's here. It affects us now. A lot of people somehow, at least when I started as commissioner three and a half years ago, most people still thought it was something about polar bears, or maybe people in small islands a long way away. And it's true, it affects people in small islands a long way away. It's true, it's going to be much worse for, for our kids and our grandchildren than it is for us now, but it's here. And it's really, the other thing that is really important is just starting to get going. So um, one of the challenges when talking about climate change is how to make it concrete. I've had a lot of people say to me, well, I can't see it. I can see smoke. And people have some kind of understanding of air pollution if they see dirty filth coming out of a smokestack. And they may have some sense of what water pollution if the water sm smells bad and looks green. But climate pollution is invisible. And so it's really hard for people to relate to it and take it seriously. It's also big and slow. Um, so I, one of the ways to do it is to talk about who it affects. A lot of the official reports talk about 2100. And honestly, I've never met anybody who really cares that much about 2100. We all expect to be dead by then. But not these two. Right? They did just go home on Sunday, I'm very grateful to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still doing laundry. But, I mean, any, a baby born today will only be 81 at the end of the century. So if today's little kids have the kind of life expectancies that we take for granted, they're going to see what Jim Hansen described as my grandchildren's storms. They are going to see the collapses that we're creating. And we need to talk about the real impacts in a way that people can relate to. So that's why. Now, Canada... Um, uh, is warming a lot faster than the global average. One of the reasons for that is we've been really cold because of the Arctic. The Arctic has been our refrigerator, <coughs> and the Arctic is one of the fastest warming parts of the world. Another thing that people don't usually recognize is that climate change is both a global and a local phenomenon, and it's not the same everywhere. So what you can see here is the change in growing seasons in Ontario over the last four decades. So there are parts of Ontario where the growing season has already changed 13 days a decade for four decades. And one of the areas that has about, um, about 10 is these darker areas. Well, I guess it's seven to nine in those darker areas in the middle of the boreal forest. Guess what happened there last year? The woods were on fire. Right? Not the way they were in California, not the way they were in British Columbia, not the way they were in Sweden, not the way they were in, in Portugal, but the woods were on fire. And where did we have some of the most uncontrollable fires? Places that are heating up fast. But you can also see on the map that there are places in blue, there's a few spots in blue, where the growing season hasn't changed at all. 
And I show you this because you need to understand that the, although the phenomenon is local, the is global, the impacts can be very local depending on topography and location and proximity to water and so on. Even when it comes to water, we're seeing real changes. So this is, again, this is only what's happened already. And in Ontario, over the last few decades, we've seen a dramatic increase in winter precipitation, especially in some places. And we're seeing dramatic changes. Places that used to only get snow in the winter now get snow and rain. And that changes everything for things that are alive. If you think about a moose, for example, a moose is exquisitely adapted to cold. But if you get them soaked with rain and then it freezes, they may die. If their food gets soaked with rain and then freezes, it's coated with ice. Changes floods, changes all kinds of things. So um, one of the things also, we hear an awful lot about averages. We talk about one and a half degrees, two degrees, um, climate will warm faster than global average. We spend an awful lot of time talking about averages. But averages are not the biggest part of the story yet. If your head's in the oven and you have third degree burns and your feet are in the freezer and you have frostbite, um, on average you are what? Right? So it's the extremes that do most of the damage. And here in, in Canada and the United States, where we are just about the luckiest people in the world, climate extremes have already quadrupled since I was here. Already. So it's a question of when, not if. It's a question of where, not if. These are all photos taken in Ontario in the last couple of years. Um, and there are all sorts of knock-on effects. Um, a whole group of health effects, you probably you might remember that dozens of people who died of heat in Quebec last year. Ontario doesn't kind of collect its numbers in the same way. We do have the first climate epidemic. Um, I, when I started going around the province talking to people, I would ask, who knows someone personally who's had Lyme disease or West Nile? And there used to be almost nobody. And now every single community I go to, many times go. This has just happened in a few years. If we want to talk about money, well, um, look what's happened to insured losses in Ontario from extreme weather just in the last few decades. For those mathematically inclined, this is inflation adjusted. So there's no inflation this figure. This is wealth adjusted, so it's adjusted for GDP. And the other thing you need to know about this is if you've got sharp eyes, you can see that the bars are different colors on the left and the right. Is that, can you see that? That's because they're from different data sources. Until 2007, the Insurance Bureau of Canada used to report uh, extreme event losses from all extreme weather. But now they only report losses from what they call catastrophic extreme weather since 2008, which is individual storms, each one of which costs more than $25 million in insured claims. So if we had all the figures on the same basis, how much more quickly would that slope go up? Now, is that the whole story? It's not. The Insurance Bureau's estimate in March of this year was that for every dollar of insured claims that they have paid out, there are three dollars in damage to public infrastructure and services. So did you know that Toronto still has $70 million in unrepaired damage from the floods in 2017 and no way to pay for them, and no prospect of paying for them? Plus, there's the uninsured financial losses, so families who don't have insurance, deductibles, people who decide not to make a claim because they'll put the premiums up too much, and that's generally estimated at from one to three times again as large. Plus, there's the non-financial losses. So climate change is already costing, well, extreme weather anyway, is already costing us far, far more than any carbon tax. And climate change is just getting started. Now, anybody think, oh, sorry, I want to go back there. Anybody think this might affect the cost of insurance? Anybody think it might affect the availability of insurance? So this is what the Insurance Bureau told us a year ago. This has already happened in other places. Right? In 
the United Kingdom after their devastating floods in 2007, the insurance companies are not charities. They are not going to keep providing insurance for people to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild in places that flood. And there's lots of places that flood and lots more places that are going to be flooding. Now, one of the most important slides is this one. Because my experience is in that when people get really bad news, whether it's financial or medical or whatever, they want to hang on for normal to come back. We talk about, you know, make blank, be blank great again. Let's wait for the normal to come back. Um, and by normal, we generally mean roughly the average of the 20th century. That's what our culverts are designed for, that's what our laws are designed for, that's what our crops are designed for. That's the, that's the zero line. And we don't live there anymore. And we know it can't come back. Because it takes about a generation between the time that we humans put climate pollution in the air and the time that we really start to experience the effects. And what's happened in the last generation? We have, even though we know why it's dangerous, even though the entire world signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, recognizing that climate change put in peril our ability to grow food, have stable societies, everything else, what have we done to our level of rate of emissions since then? gone up faster and faster. And levels of carbon dioxide in the air, up faster and faster and faster. So the level of carbon dioxide, so the rate of emissions is about two-thirds uh, two thirds larger again as it was in 1992. And we've reached truly extraordinary levels of pollution in the air with no end in sight. How many of you are from evidence-based professions? I am. So there's one big thing about evidence. It can only come from something that has happened already. So we're now permanently over 400 parts per million um, for practical purposes of carbon dioxide in the air. What happened to people the last time carbon dioxide was that high? Anybody know? There weren't any people. For millions of years, including through most of the development of human society. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere varied at most between 180 and 280 parts per million. That's it. That explains the difference between the Pleistocene and ice ages. 180 to 280. It doesn't take much. The highest level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we can have for long and have us the kind of stable world that existed when I grew up with, you know, mountain glaciers and coral reefs and fairly predictable weather, our best guess is 350. And we blew past that in 1988. And last week, it looked like we had the very first day in human history where we were at 415. Looks as if we just, just missed 415. So we're in uncharted territory. We are throwing ourselves into a completely unpredictable future through our own laziness and selfishness um, in a world that we don't know what's going to happen because it's never happened before when humans were around. So it, mean, it has impacts for everything. Climate change is everything. So one of the things is food and farming. And we know that, I mean, for some places, growing season's getting longer. That's great. But precipitation is becoming more unpredictable. Wind is getting more unpredictable. One of the big losses in last year's catastrophic weather wasn't floods. It was wind. Do you remember May 4th last year? There's also pests. We're seeing huge dials of apple trees across North America. We're seeing all kinds of new pests coming in, affecting various kinds of crops. And uh, anybody remember what happened in 1840 that really changed um, history and society. An obscure Mexican potato pest ended up in Ireland, and what happened? The whole population starved. People had to move all over the world. We are making that more likely. Then there's forests. Forests are much more vulnerable. Um, and with this rapid change in climate, 
Trees can't adapt as fast as we're changing things. And so we see these waves of new diseases coming in to the trees. And then, of course, there's fire. The more we heat up the woods, there's large parts of Ontario that are now wetter in the winter but drier in the summer. And it's warmer longer in the summer, so the fire seasons are longer. And the bugs are able to survive more because it's not as cold in the winter. So we get drier trees in hotter weather with more bugs. And what are they susceptible to? It makes them um, easy pickings for fire. And fire, again, makes climate worse. And then there's plants and animals and fish. And so what you see on the left is a picture of a big fish club. So when most of the extra heat that climate change has trapped, it's not in the air. Only about 1% of the extra heat that's been trapped is in the air, where we notice it. But 3% in ice, about 3% in soil and vegetation, where's the other 93%? It's in the water. OK, three big things that happen when you heat up water. Number one, it holds less oxygen. That matters for anything that breathes in the ocean. Number two, it takes up more space. Right? Hot air expands, or water expands. What does that do to sea level? Does it matter if you believe in it? What else happens when you heat up water? Storms are heat engines. Right? Where do they get their energy from? The heat at the surface of the ocean. The more we heat the oceans, what happens to the storms? And if you go back to the very first thing about the water not holding as much oxygen, because we see this not just in the oceans, but also in lakes. So what you see in that picture is that this is cold water fish used to living in cold water and where there's a lot of oxygen. And they live with diseases in the same way that viruses are floating around the room here and outside and everywhere time you touch a doorknob. Fish also live in a world where there are viruses, but normally healthy fish can withstand those viruses. But when the water warms up and there isn't enough oxygen, then the virus kills the fish. We saw that with the Sega antelope. We're starting to see this in other places. So we're creating these pyramiding threats. And what else? The drought in Syria put a million people on the road. Think how that has upset and overturned politics throughout Europe. The drought in the Honduras is putting, I don't know, thousands of, of Central Americans on the road because they can't feed their families anymore. How is that affecting politics south of us? We're on track to seeing hundreds of millions of people trying to find a different place. Is that going to matter to us, or are they going to leave us here in our little privileged world without any challenge? What do you think? Would you do it? So we have to get ready. I mean, this is coming. This is happening on our watch. Our kids are going to have every right to look at us because we knew all this. Right? This science has all been known for 30 years. And during that very same time, half of the climate pollution that's in the atmosphere right now was created in the last 30 years. How many have you been working for 30 years? OK, this is on our watch. With knowledge. It's not that any of this has been secret. And how much worse is it going to get? Well, that depends on us. It depends on our emissions. If we were really serious and we did everything technically possible right now, we still have a small chance of keeping climate change to something that we can, as a society, probably survive. But we're mostly not choosing that. And it's not just a question of our emissions, because it's also a question of tipping points. There are things that we control. And if we had got smart in 1992, if we'd listened to the scientists then and got really serious about reducing our use of fossil fuels, that would have been enough. But since then, we've continued to push the natural world towards its tipping point. So one of the things you see on this graph, so, uh, in one of the questions I asked, well, how would we know if we were really in an emergency? I mean, how would we recognize when we got to the point where 
all those other things we were, but everybody I know in my, in my professional life has always had a desk full of emergencies, especially everybody in public policy has always had a desk full of emergencies. Well, when, what would it take for us to know that actually this one is, should be, everything else has got to go to the side, got to deal with this one? Well, I thought it might look like this, because this is a feedback loop with sea ice. Now, you, you folks probably all know when the sun falls on ice, most of it reflects, right? When the sun falls on water, most of it is absorbed as heat. So the more ice we melt, the more heat we absorb in the oceans. The more heat we absorb in the oceans, the more ice we melt. And we've had a several decades of good global measurements of sea ice coverage. This is not mass, this is just coverage. And it went down decade by decade, but the basic pattern did not break until September 2016. And since then, we've seen catastrophic losses of ice. Last Christmas, it was, what, 16 degrees above zero at the North Pole? The year before, one-third of the ice in the Bering Sea melted in eight days in February when, I would like to remind you, it is dark. The sun does not come up. We are knocking the whole world's climate off course, and it's us doing it. And it's mostly us, the rich people. Right, the, rich, the richer 500 million people in the world really are doing this pretty much without much help from the other 6 billion or so. So, is it too late? Obvious question. And I have to say, too late for what? Is it too late for those young people that we care about to have the same world growing up that we will, that we had? Yeah, it's too late for that. We threw that away. Is it too late to avoid real big changes to the way we'd like things to be. Yeah, it's too late for that too. But is it too late to make a difference in what's ahead? And the answer is not yet. Not quite yet. We've got a pretty small handful of years to make big changes, and that's right now. And what Canada does matters. We, although we have a small population, we're one of the world's 10 largest climate polluters, and we're also some of the luckiest people in the world in terms of avoid minimizing climate damage and what's happening in the Philippines and in Africa and in India and in South China and Bangladesh and many other places is much worse than we're experiencing. So it's really visible whether we say, all right, well, you know what, we're coming, we're, I'm all right, Jack. You, you guys, everybody else, you deal with this problem. I don't feel like it. And the crazy thing is, that here in Ontario, we were doing a lot right. Now, believe me, I found many things to criticize. But we were doing an awful lot right in Ontario. Did you have a pretty good life a year ago? And we were doing many important, essential things. We closed the coal plants to make electricity, dramatically improved our air quality. Uh, in terms of breathing, do you remember, for those of you who are from the GTA, do you remember when the air was yellow? You'd come in and you'd see that smear across the horizon. Well, what was it? It was coal plants. Did you notice when that stopped happening? People don't notice good things. How many smog days did we have in 2005? Anybody remember? 53. Those were brutally hard days for people with asthma, like my late husband. How many have we had? How many did we have in 2014 once we closed the last coal plant? Zero. Did it put our electricity prices up? Yes. Which do you like better? Saving a few bucks in electricity bill or breathing? <laughs> These are the kinds of public policy choices that governments are there for. And when they do it well, we take it for granted and complain about the consequences. But when they don't do it well, we could still be breathing that filth. And in fact, closing the coal plants was the largest single climate pollution reduction, but it made our own lives better more directly. We put a price on carbon. It wasn't a very big price on carbon, but we did have a cap and trade system that was working amazingly well. We were using all of that money. Um, GGRA, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Account, there was a, a requirement by law to use all that money to help us move to a cleaner, greener economy, and I reported on how that and I've got one of those reports here. Bottom line is it's doing a lot of good. 
Um, and we were just getting started in adaptation, which is something that no one has wanted to get serious about because it's going to be so incredibly expensive. But the crazy thing is, we have so much to gain from dramatically reducing our use of fossil fuels, and it's not, it's, this is not a hair shirt thing. This is not, okay, we're going to have to do terrible things for ourselves because we care about polar bears. This is that we can have an awful lot of benefits if we reduce our use of fossil fuels, and the climate benefit is one of them. And it's in particular um, one of the things to think about is health. Because, again, anybody here like breathing? For, because we've closed our coal plants and we've reduced our industrial pollution, for most people in Ontario, the biggest source of air pollution that's a threat to public health is from tailpipes. So if you've got a daddy pushing a little girl in a stroller along a busy road, he's getting a fair bit of pollution, but she's getting 60% more. Because her nose is pretty much at the level of the tailpipe. And she's breathing faster, and her lungs are immature and less able to deal with it, and she's got longer ahead of her, hopefully, for the contaminants to damage her lungs. And we know that the pollution from tailpipe vehicles is really heavily concentrated along busy roads. So who gets the worst of that? Well, anybody who spends a lot of time in traffic on busy roads, anybody who lives along those roads, and anybody who spends their days in institutions along those roads, and guess where we have, for example, a quarter of our elementary schools and half of our long-term care facilities? Along the busiest roads with the dirtiest air. And this is all from vehicles, for most of whom we have easy technological solutions already. So cap and trade was starting to work. I mean, it didn't get much time. Ontario has an $800 billion a year economy. It takes time to change the direction of an $800 billion a year economy that's three quarters dependent on fossil fuels. And the cap and trade program was a little program. It was less than $2 billion a year. It takes time for a $2 billion a year program to change the direction of an $800 billion a year economy. But even so, in the tiny time that we allowed it to work, I was really amazed at, you know, it did just what we expect. Um, it gave people a financial incentive for reducing the climate pollution. When pollution's free, you get more of it. This, this, is not, this is not very fancy. When there's a cost to it, then A, there's a financial benefit for reducing it. But more simply, people, the financial officer has to know how much there is. And then there's a financial reason to let smart young people come up with suggestions for how to reduce it. And what we saw all over the economy, that lots of people had ideas. And very often, they simply had known, it was known it all along, but couldn't do it because they couldn't get an approval or they couldn't get access to funding. Um, and one of the things that we know about cap and trade is that three quarters of the money went to taxpayer funded organizations. Municipalities, schools, hospitals, public housing, public transit, places that use an awful lot of fossil fuels and never could get the capital to make investments to get more efficient. And once they had the capital, they ran for opportunities. Ontario's hospitals were on track to save $60 million a year in operating costs, which they were plowing back into patient care. Public housing. Public housing, they've got these buildings that were thrown up cheap, leak like hell. They never get money to do repairs. When they started getting money to make these buildings more efficient, not only did it slash the operating costs in half, it meant that the people who live in those buildings could finally have a decent quality of life instead of some people freezing and some people baking and everybody having leaks. So tremendous number of benefits that were happening. Um, and we know what works. I know Ontario's got um, more than a generation of experience with regulating polluters, and we know what works. There's only a few things that really work. Hand-waving does not work. Cheap beer does not work. <laughs> okay. um, what works? Three things. Number one, a price. When pollution costs something, you get less. Number two, investing in solutions. The carbon price also provided the money for that. And number three, regulations. You can do a lot with regulations. So slow, closing the coal plants was a regulation. It was much more expensive than a carbon price would have been, but 
people tend to not notice it anyway, but they have. But those are the things that work. And we know that making polluters pay, that a polluter pay approach really works. And we're one of the world's poster children for this. Anybody remember acid rain? Acid rain was a really, really huge problem. Why did we have acid rain? Like rain literally coming out of the sky, pH 3, 3.5, killing everything it touched. Why did we have it? Well, it was because of sulfur and nitrogen oxides being emitted by large companies, particularly the large metal companies in the north and also from coal burning and other things. And when uh, environmentalists started to say, you know, it's really bad to kill all our lakes and forests. This is stupid. We should make the companies clean up. And the companies, oh, no, no, you can't do that. Like, aren't you guys happy with money? Who needs lakes and trees? Have money. And, uh, but the devastation kept growing and growing and growing. And finally, the companies were forced to dramatically reduce their pollution. And for example, Inco started capturing the sulfur and selling it as a product instead of dumping it into the air. Did Inco go out of business? They're making more metal than ever. So we've set a world example that you really can solve big problems if you pay attention and use appropriate controls to force innovation. Clean Bend, it turned out to be much less expensive than the companies said it was going to be. Once they had to do it, they figured out how. So we do know what works, but we're not doing any of it now. So since the election last June, the new provincial government has been really active, destroying pretty much everything that had been built in the previous 15 years to reduce our climate pollution uh, on all kinds of fronts, including abolishing my office. So we've got lots of things that are gone or in danger. Our climate law is gone. Our Green Energy Act is gone. The Endangered Species Act is being slashed and burned. Conservation authorities are being slashed. The health units are being slashed. Environmental assessments being slashed. The green belt has been uh, repeatedly threatened. Uh, the growth plan is being weakened. Uh, funding for pretty much everything that makes things better is being um, is being eliminated. And in addition to that, um, yeah, we have this extraordinary situation where the government is has passed that I, my last count, 18 times passed special legislation to get itself immunity for breaking the law, for breaking contracts, um, for breach of fiduciary duty, breach of trust, um, misrepresentation, breach of the Securities Act without paying compensation. And one of the things they did was cancel 752 contracts for clean energy uh, in Ontario, many of which had been awarded after you know, multiple year, multi-million dollar competitions. Um, and as soon as they canceled all those contracts saying we didn't need the power, the independent electrical system operator reported that, okay, now we don't have enough power capacity to keep all the lights on on hot afternoons in, wait for it, 2023, which is four years from now. Uh, it's also, I mean, a huge setback to our reputation around the world as a safe place to do business. And it's a big setback to indigenous peoples because this is supposed to be a time of reconciliation with First Nations. First Nations need a stable economic base. Their economic base used to be the land. Uh, the rest of us took away almost all the land and put them in the poorest places. So they have to rebuild from almost nothing. And one of the ways that they accepted the offer was to say, all right, be partners in indigenous um, clean energy projects. And so something like 216 of the canceled projects had significant First Nations investment and participation, but we canceled all of those, because I guess we don't want that either. And then, uh, as if that wasn't enough, so now we know for sure, yeah, by 2023, we don't have enough power to keep the lights on, especially because we used to be a winter peaking system. We used to use more electricity in the winter, but now most years, almost all years now, we use more electricity in the summer for cooling. And as the summers get hotter, we need more cooling. Um, and the, the meeting peak demand for electricity is really, really expensive. Um, Electricity is one of the three areas that I reported on electricity and energy policy generally was the one that both politicians and the public understand the least. 
Um, but anyway, finding, providing all the clean electricity, from, sorry, providing electricity at all on hot afternoons is really expensive, and by far the cheapest way to do it, there's a clue on the slide, is conservation. So, would we like to do the cheapest way, or would we like to do a more expensive way? So we've just slashed our conservation programs, and uh, now we're going to have much less electricity conservation, so we will have to buy more fossil fuel powered electricity. I think we've got lots of other things making things worse. We already have in the Greater Toronto area, you'd be glad to know, we're number one on a couple of, th couple of really important things. We have the worst commutes in North America, worse than New York City, worse than Los Angeles, and, um, and, and here's another thing you can be proud of. The International Energy Agency uh, recently reported who in the world drives the most inefficient, most climate polluting vehicles in the world. Anyone in Canada, hands up, please. We're it. We're number one. We have beaten out the United States for the worst vehicles in the world. Congratulations. But we spend a lot of money subsidizing fossil fuel use. We own about $625 million a year in Ontario alone. So, um, yeah. So really, from a public policy point of view, things are really bad. When we're dealing with large collective problems, we need collective solutions. And our mechanism as a human society for making collective decisions and enforcing them is government. Right? That's what government is. And so we expect government to basically lay the track, set the direction, set the targets, give us a general sense of what to do, and hopefully provide some kind of encouragement. Well, that's not happening at the moment. But what they told us at the Paris Climate Conference is you can think about this as a three-way race. You can think about governments as laying the track, business as the engine, and finance as the fuel. If the government's doing pretty much uniformly bad things, should the rest of us give up? Well, no, so what, what can we do? Well, for, for businesses and organizations and individuals at every level, it seems to me there are really only these three things. We have to reduce our climate pollution. We have to reduce our climate pollution. Every additional ton matters. Every additional ton of climate pollution we're putting in the atmosphere makes what's coming worse, harder to withstand, harder to survive, harder to cope with. And we have to reduce our own pollution and everybody else's. And the thing is, there's all kinds of great ideas. So, um, no, there aren't any toilets on the bus. <laughs> but there is one municipality in Ontario that is using methane from sewage poop to run its bus. And it's Hamilton. But Hamilton, they're Canadian. They don't paint this on the bus. So I had to use a British picture. But there are really an unlimited number of opportunities when you actually start look around to say, could we do this without fossil fuels? Actually, there's a tremendous number of ideas and opportunities and technologies and methods, and a lot of them make your life better. I mean, having a two-hour commute in a car does not make your life better. So one of the easiest things is to just like conserve energy. Why do we waste? Like, didn't your grandmother tell you not to waste stuff? Mm -hmm. right? well, so we're really foolish to waste so much energy. Well, conserving is good for the economy, it's good for public health, it's good for well-being, and most of our um, energy, as I think I mentioned in Ontario, is fossil fueled. Right? Three quarters of our energy is fossil fueled. A lot of people still think that energy and electricity are the same. This is not so. Electricity is the smallest and cleanest of our major energy sources. And in Ontario, it has been mostly nuclear and renewable. So no, that doesn't mean um, unproblematic, but it does mean from a climate point of view that it's not very bad. But it costs us a huge amount of money, all that fossil fuel. So we produce almost no fossil fuels here, and that means we import it all. And we import some of it from Western Canada, we import some of it from the US, we import some of it from other places. But that drains between 16 and $25 billion out of the economy every single year. And then again the next year, and then again the next year. Going up and down with the price of oil and the Canadian dollar. So if we were, I don't know, 10% more efficient, can anybody think of anything useful we might be able to do with one or two billion dollars? And what I showed in my last report, this one, um, is that based on the invaluable evidence, we could be financially the same or better and use 30% less. 
So we know that energy efficiency is good for the economy. Is it better, if you have $100, is it better to spend it importing fossil fuel from somewhere else, or is it better to spend it on some young person going to insulate a house? Right? Sort of no-brainer. Um, we know that renovations in particular are a really easy opportunity. Uh, in Sweden, it's just as cold as here. They've been able to reduce their fossil fuel consumption in buildings by about 86% while we've mostly sat on our hands. And a lot of that is making the buildings more efficient, but also turning to alternate sources of, fu of fuel. And then, of course, we have to talk about cars because it is the largest source of our pollution. It's the largest, it's fastest growing. Transportation is our major source of climate pollution as well as of air pollution. Um, and you hear, you, know, you certainly hear people saying, well, we want the polluters to pay. And by that, they generally mean somebody other than me. <laughs> but it isn't somebody other than me. It's all of us, people driving around in ordering freight. We are largest, larger polluters than industry from a climate point of view. And in terms of where there is, because if you look at heavy industry, heavy industry provides less climate pollution than driving around. Um, and you can see the, the orange is non-energy uses of fossil fuels. So you tend to hear the government sometimes say, well, we want to focus on polluters, hoping that people will think that does not mean. And we want to focus on technologically available solutions. You might have heard that. So for that orange stuff, by and large, there are no technical solutions. In fact, for more than half of the emissions of industry, there are no technological alternatives that exist now or are around the corner. But for people driving around, guess what? We have technological alternatives right now for personal transportation uh, in most circumstances. What matters most is land use. Uh, on, in, on, on, I've said many times that land use is Ontario's oil sands. It is the largest cause of our emissions. It is land use development is the most powerful force in our politics and in political financing. And it's locking us into a long-term future where we are going to be doing the wrong thing for a long time. Um, we know that urban sprawl has enormously high costs. In, including to the municipalities where it happens and to the people who have to live there. The cost of providing services in the suburbs is about three times as large as the cost of providing service in an urban area, just because people are farther apart. So you need more, more meters of sewer, more meters of road, more meters of everything else. So of course, taxes are higher in the, in the small areas. And also we're forcing more and more people to live in areas that have too low density to ever support transit, and basically no local jobs. We're on track now to see another million people being forced into those areas. So if you think commuting's bad now, we are on track to make it unimaginably worse because we're putting another million people in places where they will have no alternative but to drive themselves, because there's no jobs nearby, no schools nearby, no, um, and no prospect that there reasonably will be, or transit. But then we have this slide about the fleet. Um, so you can see there we are, number one, with the worst vehicles in the world. Now there are solutions. If some of these graphics would do it. Okay, so there are definitely are solutions. We know this. Yes, of course, there are lots of people who need a place to live. And we know that if we keep pushing most of the growth out into paving over wetlands and woodlands and agricultural land, not only do we lose the land that we desperately need for holding water and growing wood and food, uh, we also push people into these unsustainable, very expensive, very difficult, very stressful lives at the very same time that we have huge amounts of land in existing serviced areas near jobs where we're not allowing houses. And if you think about, for example, Scarborough. So when Scarborough was built, the infrastructure was designed expecting that every family would have a, you know, two parents, maybe a grandmother, and maybe four kids. So you build the houses assuming you'd have six or seven people going to the toilet. How many people are in those houses now? Most of these areas are stagnating or losing population. They can't keep enough people to keep local shops alive. And yet all the young people who need a place to live would be very happy to live in places like that if they were allowed to put in not more towers, 
but reasonable middle density where there's infrastructure and a way to get to work and, and some jobs available. So there are lots of things that we know can be done. In terms of personal footprints, it isn't just a collective problem. We do also take individual action. And so the very last thing I managed to squeeze out of the office just before we were abolished was uh, an individual carbon footprint fact sheet um, and with, a, with a very detailed backup. And for people in Ontario, half of the individual pollution comes from four things. Anybody want to guess what they are? I think there's a clue on the slide. <laughs> Come on, somebody can read. Driving, Driving. what else? Driving. Home heating, flying. flying, and beef. Yeah. Meat has a big carbon footprint. Beef has an outstandingly big carbon footprint. And um, so we need to know about our personal footprints. We also need to be demanding collective action. Because, anyway, so we have to reduce our pollution. We have to get ready for what's coming because it's on its way. And the third thing everybody needs to do, and this is very un-Canadian, is to speak up. I mean, it's especially important in election year, but it's important every year. Selfishness, greed, and apathy aren't problems that lawyers can solve. They're not problems that scientists can solve. This is going to take all of us bringing what we can to this. The climate crisis is not the only thing going on, but it does give us this tremendous opportunity to make things better. You know, lots of people won't do things unless their back is against the wall. Bloody well, our back is pretty close to the wall. So we have an obligation, we have an opportunity, and how do we do it? Well, I would like you to repeat this after me. Simple, clear messages. Simple, clear messages. Re repeat it often. By a variety of trusted voices. By a variety of trusted voices. Okay, you are all trusted voices in some circles. Right? We need everybody to speak up, and we need you to take that voice to other places. Um, three of the key topics, and there's so many, but here's three you could speak up about. And, you know, it can really feel quite daunting. I had a, a young woman in one of my, my talks uh, at a health unit a little while ago. Um, you know, she's young, pretty, blonde, probably the youngest person on the committee she was on. Uh, she was on an emergency measures committee. And so she screwed up her courage and she said, climate change, because right? they're talking about disasters. And it was like she had farted, right? Everybody just ignored her, they just went on. So she took a deep breath, the next month she came back. She said, climate change. And there was sort of a rustling of papers. It was like, we're not allowed to talk about that around here. Right? So the next minute she came back, she raised it again. And this time, finally, somebody else said, ah, oh, well, maybe we should talk about climate change. And so she was able, by not giving up, even though she was the youngest person there, to get this on the table, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. Pretending that we can deal with emergencies without paying attention to what's causing them, it's so. So how do you start climate conversations? Well, there's a couple of different um, tools. For, for business people, the Task Force on Climate-Related um, Financial Disclosures, the TCFD, hugely influential in terms of every organization needing to disclose what is its carbon footprint and how is it going to cope? What is its plan for coping? So a lot of really useful tools there for businesses. And then two other tools just about to have conversations for anybody. One of them is this new article by Dan Rubin. I reposted it on Twitter and LinkedIn, and you can find it on Google, that he did in February 11 steps to have a useful conversation about climate with just about anybody. Um, and for those in the GTA, carbonconversations.to is, is has a group for people to get together and basically practice having these conversations in a safe place so that you can then carry it out into the rest of your life. So how many people would like to have a little bit of hope? <laughs> this is the only formula I know. But we have to start by looking at the facts, even though I don't like the facts. We have to start by knowing what's really going on. But then, that's not enough. Because if we only know the facts and we don't do anything, A, we're going to give up, and B, the problem's not going to get solved. 
So after we look at the facts, we then have to look at each other and find a way to do something concrete now together. So there you go. No one can do everything. Everybody can do something. I hope that you will. Thank you.